Well, good morning to everybody. Welcome on behalf of the Trinity Bible Church to this service. If you are new to this platform, um, it's great to have you with us participating in one of our sermons. And um, just trust that God will speak to you through His Word. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. Why don't we pray together? Father God, we thank you for a brand new day. And we thank you that every new day means that we have more opportunity to live for you, to honor you with our lives, to find ways to be more um, responsive and obedient to the word of God and the Holy Spirit prompting us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that your spirit desires to keep us in line with the precepts of Scripture. And that your spirit desires for us to do those things which always bring glory and honor to you. And so we pray as we come before you, Lord Jesus, that you'd forgive us when we have not, we have not been in line with the Spirit of God. When we have done our own thing. When we've let the flesh rule our minds and our hearts and our behavior. Forgive us for that, Lord Jesus. Forgive us for our sins. Oh, Lord Jesus, we repent. We confess that we are sinners, always in need of the work of our Savior. We thank you that in Christ we are declared right with God. We thank you that in Christ we are being made right before God. And so, Lord Jesus, as you continue that process, may we experience more victory in our walk with you. May we experience more of the power of the Holy Spirit aiding us and equipping us to walk for you. May we find ourselves exhibiting the true marks of a believer, one who has been declared righteous and who, ha and who keeps in step with the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord Jesus to live lives surrendered and yielded to the Holy Spirit and in obedience to the Word of God. Then, Lord Jesus, we pray for um, the, the members of our congregation who are struggling with health challenges. May you come alongside them, Lord Jesus. May you bring healing to their bodies. May you bring, bring, bring strength into their minds and into their hearts that they may persevere in these difficult times and that no matter what you decide regards to healing or not healing that you would allow them to experience the joy of the Lord because their hope is in you they rejoice in you you are their hope you are their salvation you are their all Lord Jesus we want to live lives like that that in spite of challenges, we still honor you. In spite of difficulties, we still live for you. So, Lord Jesus, help us to keep doing that. Lord God, give us the ability to persevere, the ability to remain strong under difficult circumstances, and at the same time to be full of the joy of the Lord. Bless the service, bless the sermon, bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you very much again for participating. If you're a guest, you are welcome on this platform. Um, as a church, we are hoping for the day that we can gather together soon, face to face and not just via videos and YouTube. Um, we are grateful that interaction and human contact and face to face has been, um, has been allowed. But in the context of where we worship as a church in a retirement village, um, that village has not yet opened its doors, but we're hopeful, and maybe you can pray towards this, that by the 1st of November 2020, just two or three weeks away, we will be having our first service together. That's our hope, and that's our prayer. All right, folks, why don't you um, uh, take the Word of God, open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, because that's the passage that we are looking at. We've already preached a little bit on Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. And today I want us to jump across to Romans 12, um, from verse 9 through to 21. And I'm not going to read the whole passage now, because we are going to um, 
look at the verses and then pick out the marks of a true Christian. That's our focus. We probably won't complete it because I've divided those um, verses into seven sections, um, seven parts, and we will just get through how many we ever, how many ever we get through in the next 25 minutes or so. So let's jump in there as we start with um, the one of the the first passage, Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, which says, "Let love be genuine." abhor what is evil hold fast to what is good love one another with brotherly affection outdo one another in showing honor now that was from the english standard version all right so many of you realize that i jump around from version to version um, just depending on how it um, presents it um, but i'd encourage you to to read the different version <coughs> excuse me, to read the different versions um, because it's helpful. It just continues to develop our understanding of God's Word. So Romans 12 has, according to my calculation, 39 clear instructions to the believer. 39 instructions on how to live, on how to behave, on how to, how to treat one another in the church, in the body of Christ. But they go way beyond just the body of Christ. Um, when it says love one another, it doesn't mean only love Christians. No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it means that these things must be evident within the body of Christ. So, verse 9 and 10 reveal to us um, a number of things, five things that, that, we, that will mark us as true believers. And, um, but the, the, the key thing around that is sincere and genuine love. So, notice what it says in verse 9a. Love must be genuine let love be genuine it says in the english standard version okay other versions use the the word sincere your love must be sincere hate what is evil cling to what is good um, it says in one of the other translations so from verse 9 and 10 we get the following marks of a true christian exhibit genuine love hate what is evil cling to what is good be devoted to one another. Love each other with brotherly affection. Okay, well that's part of number four. And then honor others above yourselves. So if we were to take those instructions, we can see that we can nail it down to one thing. Exhibit genuine love. And in a way, genuine love is the the mark of a true believer it's the one that covers all the rest we're going to talk about so everything comes back to does this exhibit genuine love does this exhibit sincere love towards one another and so as you look at your life as a Christian you need to be saying am I expressing sincere love towards my fellow Christ follower and if God presses you to show that love beyond your Christ, um, beyond the Christ follower, then that's what you ought to do. In fact, as we get it right in the church, it becomes a great testimony outside of the church. The love we have for each other in the church is a mark of a true believer and it's a witness and a testimony to those outside of the church. But we are to love others as Christ loved us. So this love must definitely go beyond just the church. But these are marks of how we live within the body of Christ. So let's get it right in this place. Exhibit genuine love. All right. Now, a couple of questions to ponder as we think about this is, you need to ask, how genuine is your love? Is your love a reflection of God's love for you? That's, that's an important question. Is your love a reflection of God's love for you? And then do you resolutely cling to what is good? Do you hate what is evil? Or do you find yourself sometimes loving and maybe even enjoying things that God hates? And another way to look at all of this sincerity, of this, uh, genuine love, sincere love, is to ask the question, are you devoted to the members of your church in in spite of their differences are you devoted to them because that's a picture of sincere love 
Do you honor your fellow Christ followers above yourself? You see, loving one another is not just a matter of words. And that's why the Bible says, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. As Christ followers, that's what we're about. We hold to the word of God, which is good news. It's good news to a world that needs to hear it. It's good news about the love of God to his creation. It's good news because it teaches us how to live good lives. And it says that we love each other with brotherly affection. There's meant to be a real affection in the way we love one another. And then it's, it's it, the last little phrase probably sums it up best. Outdo one another in showing honor. And that's all about the way we treat others. Sometimes someone will do something that we will be offended by. And here in this moment where the verse says, outdo one another in showing honor, it means that I will go, wait a minute, I might be offended by what they just said or just did to me. But I am not going to respond and retaliate out of offense. I must hate what is evil. And responding in offensive behavior is not pleasing and honoring to God. Outdo one another in showing honor. Treat one another with love and respect, with brotherly affection, even if you've let the side down. Even if you've got a real gripe to grind against another person and they've done something wrong towards you. This says, let your love be genuine. And it's saying, therefore, that if you have a gripe against another brother or sister in Christ and you climb into them, then that's not honorable. That's not showing brotherly affection. That's being the judge, jury and executioner. And it's void of love and compassion and forgiveness and reconciliation. It, it doesn't desire the good in the other person. It just desires to get even. That's not a mark of a believer. That's just the mark of every other human being. And so Christianity, folks, when we're living the way God wants us to live, is so different to the world's ways. Okay, so... Point number one, the mark of a true believer is to let your love be sincere and genuine. It's, it's, it's clothed with brotherly affection. And you, you can enter into competition with one another by trying to outdo how you honor one another. Now, how about that for a good competition for us? If anybody's upset you, consider how you can can show love towards that person and outdo each other in terms of treating each other that way. Now the second section, part two of Marks of a True Christian, deals with zeal and spiritual fervor. And it comes from verse 11 which says, Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. English Standard Version. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Okay, so here's an, an interesting word, the word slothful. I mean, just picture the sloth for a moment. Here we have, for one, a strange animal. It's a mammal, and if you have ever seen a sloth, then you will know that it is a creature that creeps very slowly it seems to have lazy movements now you compare a sloth with a springbok um, maybe a springbok grazing grass out in the field but even as it grazes there's an alertness about it it's aware of its surroundings and it's ready to dart away from danger two pictures emerge the sloth seems to be lazy and have mo no mo real motivation. And yet we have, on the other hand, um, the springbok who seems to be um, full of fervor and sprightly and energetic, full of zeal. The sloth or the springbok. Now the believer is charged with serving the Lord with enthusiasm, 
with desire, with spiritual passion, with fervor. And we need to note that chapter 12 deals with the proper use of spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. You know, verse 9 to 21 is describing the believer's proper attitude and behavior in exercising our God-given uh, abilities and gifts within the body of Christ in such a way that it edifies the body, that it helps other members within the body. We don't want to come and into the body of Christ and cause division. We want to improve um, unity. We want to improve affection for one another. We want to improve the dynamics that allow us to, to work together, care for one another, and become an amazing testimony and witness to the world. The true marks of Christianity described in these verses are the characteristics of normal Christians. Normal Christians, folks. The, the list of 39 instructions in Romans 12, verse 9 to 21, are not optional extras. They are meant to be the characteristics of normal Christians. Everyday Christians. You don't have to become a super saint. These are meant to characterize you and me. You don't have to, you don't only exhibit these if you go and study theology for four or five years and become a pastor. Not a chance. These instructions and these characteristics of a true believer are, in a sense, one could say, gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They are part of lives that no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but are being transformed by God as your minds are renewed, as you embrace and absorb the Word of God. Remember, we have been challenged in verse 1 and 2 to not conform to the pattern of this world, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. That's what we're meant to do. That's for every believer. And the extent to which we get that right is the extent to which these characteristics will be exhibited in our lives, will be kind of a, a fruit on display because we are being transformed and changed into the likeness of Christ. The more we are like Christ, folks, the more we exhibit the qualities of Christ in our lives. And so one of the marks of a true believer, as I've just said now, is spiritual fervor, enthusiasm and desire and passion in serving God's purposes. Folks, it says, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Don't become lazy in your walk with God, folks. Be full of enthusiasm. Pick up the word regularly. Read it. Apply it. Spend time in prayer. Gather together with other believers. Make that your habit. These are all things that add to our spiritual fervor, that show that we, these things are important to us. If you're dealing with difficulties and, and sin issues in your life, spiritual fervor means we press in to gaining victory over those areas. We say, God, I need your help here. Zeal and spiritual fervor are not just about being activists. It's about chasing after what honors and pleases God and getting rid of all the things that don't honor and please God. That's why the Word of God says that we are to run the race in, 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 in such a way as to win the race and that we are to throw off all the sin that entangles and ensnares us. Spiritual fervor includes repentance, confession, and pursuing Christ in worship. Folks, our next mark of a true Christian, part three, deals with three words, joy, patience, and prayer. Romans 12 verse 12 says this, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Folks, the Christian hope is certain. I mean, it's completely certain. Uh, it's not a pipe dream. 
we have placed a Hebrew says that it's not a pipe dream. It says that we can be absolutely convinced of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see, which is our eternal salvation and our eternal home in heaven. And so our Christian hope is as certain as the next wave that's going to roll up onto the seashore. The Christian's hope is ironclad, it's rock solid. We get to go to heaven because we are sinners redeemed and declared righteous by God. Our joy is found in the source of our hope, which is none other than Jesus Christ. Because of the value of what is hopeful, which is Jesus, and the truth of our inheritance, eternal life, we get to rejoice with loud hosannas. We get to rejoice and, and exclaim and say, yes, just like a surfer exclaims and goes, woohoo, when they see another surfer catch an epic wave. They can appreciate and, 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 and feel the satisfaction that that surfer has in that moment when they catch a good wave. Folks, we rejoice with loud hosannas like the angels rejoice with loud hosannas when another person gets saved. Because suddenly we know that their hope is now certain. That what they have hoped for has become a reality. Their hope for eternal life, their hope in Jesus Christ has become something real. And it's now not just a pipe dream. It's, a, it's standing on a very sure foundation. So what is the value of hope? Rejoice in hope. We rejoice in something that we are sure of. Our eternity. And that's a mark of a true Christian. Not constantly caught up in what's going on around them in the world. But rejoicing in what's still to come. That's where our hope lies, folks. The world around us is hopeless. And we live in a hopeless world. It will come to an end. But we stand on something sure and certain. Our eternal destiny through Jesus Christ. Now, what is the value of being patient in affliction? And perhaps we should rather ask, whether, uh, what are the benefits of being impatient under affliction or tribulation? There doesn't seem to be any reasonable or helpful benefit to impatience of any kind. Who by impatience has added value to their lives? However, the value of patience is enormous. It's no wonder patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Impatience breeds rash, emotional, and bizarre responses to affliction and, and tribulation. I've witnessed so many surfers getting very impatient with the sea. <laughs> now think about that for a moment. Your impatience will never improve the quality of the waves if the waves are small, weak, and, and not performing. It doesn't help to moan and complain and swear. But here's the rub. Here's the rub. Your impatience will definitely remove your joy and you'll complain that every wave was useless. Uh, and now I'm referring to surfers. But a patient surfer next to you will smile, will say, man, this has been a great session. I've had so much fun today. I haven't had fun like this in ages. Not because the waves are the best, but because they're patient. Because they're making the best of that situation. And because they have the right attitude, when they do catch a fun little wave, they get the same stoke and enjoyment out of that wave as if it was an epic wave. Patience has a way of elevating your spiritual altitude <laughs> and your spiritual attitude. It affects the atmosphere around you and it brings the power of God into difficult situations. Patience, therefore, is, an, is a very important mark of a true believer. How many of us have let impatience rule in our hearts as we talk about the coronavirus and its vast health and economic ramifications on the lives of ordinary people. Yet as Christians we should be marked by patience under tribulation. You see verse 12 is about 
what sets us apart from unbelievers? These marks of a true believer are to set us apart from others. Not set us apart in a holier than a holier art thou way, but to set us apart in terms of we, we march to a different drumbeat. We don't just get caught up in the ways of the world the way the world does. Because we are being transformed. We are no longer conforming to the patterns of this world. What is your go-to response to impatience? What is your go-to response to patience? Are you more patient or more impatient when trouble comes your way? Have you pondered on how God wants you to respond under tribulation? Consider this. The church has flourished under persecution throughout the world, throughout the centuries. Because the world gets to see whose lives are compelled by the love of God. It gets to see people's lives who are compelled by the love of God, transformed by the word of God. And this is then evidenced in joyful hope, in being patient in affliction, and is accompanied by much sincere prayer. So as I close, I close with this thought and this mark of a true believer. Constant in prayer. Folks, tribulation and, aff and affliction are often the driving forces behind helping us to get down on our knees. I know that through some of the darkest days of my life, because I was in that place, it drove me to my knees. And it drove me to a place where I experienced some of the sweetest joy and comfort from God that I've ever experienced in my life. We've got to get onto our knees. Let's not just complain about what's going on around us. Let it drive us to our knees. You see, folks, God has ultimate control. And we can entrust our lives to Him completely. I pray that you would take to heart the marks of a true believer as found in Romans 12, 9-21. And you would begin to say, Lord, help me to live these out today. And that you will take stock and evaluate yourself with regards to this. Because it can bring joy into your lives. But at the same time, it becomes a powerful testimony to a world who's struggling right now. A topsy-turvy world. Let's ponder these thoughts. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you've equipped us um, through your word and through the Holy Spirit to live the life you've called us to live. You don't just call us to live holy lives and then not equip us. You are the one constantly working in us and equipping us. And so we want to exhibit these characteristics, these marks of a true believer in our lives. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll help us to, to grow as Christ followers, more and more mature, exhibiting this type of behavior where we live for you, where we honor you, where we care for one another with brotherly love and affection, um, where we rejoice, where we are patient, where we get down on our knees and pray. We commit our lives to you this morning. But we do that as we cry out to you and say, help us, Lord Jesus. Equip us and empower us to honor you this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you folks. Have a great week.